My name is Barbara Marshall and I'm a volunteer here at the Victoria Art Gallery and Museum and I'm going to be talking to you today about Gogglehead. Now, when I take people on tours and I stop at this sculpture and say how fantastic I think it is, they often look at me as if I'm a bit daft, although they often do that as well. Because it certainly isn't beautiful, is it? It's not something I think that you would particularly want to have in your house. And this is a piece of artwork, as many pieces of artwork, you really do need to know something about it. The main reason I knew something about it, I think, was serendipity. When I was teaching at the community college, I had a video of Elizabeth Frink's life, which is absolutely fantastic, and I keep meaning to go and see if I can get a copy of it. It was an old video then, and it followed her until the week before she died. And the, the, she died the week before the risen Christ, which is above the doorway of the Anglican Cathedral, was actually put up. And in this film, it shows you putting it up in, on a horrendously windy day and it was just absolutely fantastic and moving. So I learned quite a lot about Elizabeth Frink and about this sculpture. Um, as I say, it's not beautiful, it is brutish, it is violent, it is evil looking and perhaps that's what a lot of her work is actually about. There, there are beautiful pieces of work, particularly in animals, but mostly when she's using the human figure, it is the worst side of mankind. It's man's inhumanity to man. Um, but then we also do get some wonderful nature and although we can't see any here I encourage you to look up on the internet some of her images of horses and dogs. I'm sure they gave her a lot of peace compared to what mankind does. I need to tell you something about the background of this as well. Whilst you can yourself look at this brutish huge head which actually looks a little bit like Elizabeth Frink. She had a very long jaw and often in her work she seems to put herself, she was, a, she was a handsome woman, not a pretty woman. But the first thing you notice really is the mouth open, the sort of snarl, the fairly impassive features, of course impassive because he's got dark glasses on. And here's a series, there were six of these made called goggle heads because we cannot see through the goggles there. I need to tell you about two men and the Algerian War of Independence as well. First of all, I don't, need, don't want to tell you about this man, I want to tell you about the man that this man had killed. And that man was somebody called Ben Barker, who was an Algerian fighter for independence. Algeria, as many countries, had a colonial past, a particularly violent colonial past with French invaders, where they took the land and many people were uh, disenfranchised and, and treated extremely badly. This came to the foreground in the 50s and the 60s when there was a huge movement from ex-colonial um, countries for the people who lived in the colonies to take over the running of their own country and this is what happened in Algiers as well and there was in fact the Algerian War of Independence which lasted for three years. Not this chap, the chap that this one murdered. Uh, Uf Kier was a freedom fighter and he knew do we, do we want to stop? Should we keep going? Ufke was a freedom fighter uh, in Algiers who was a friend of uh, Che Guevara and a friend of Malcolm X. And before he was killed, or rather disappeared, he was about to chair an international conference for, um, I just need to check the name of this, the, the first international meeting of third world libera liberation groups when he was disappeared. He was disappeared on the orders of this man. He wasn't directly killed by this man. This man was a Moroccan general known for his thuggishness called General Ouf Kier, known both for the brutality of his actions but by his hallmark dark glasses so that you could never actually see what he was thinking. And I'd like to read you something about these dark glasses written by a playwright called Brian Phelan who wrote a play in the 80s called Article 5 which was based on the UN Declaration of Human Rights and Article 5 was the, the part that deals with torture. And Phelan says, when I studied the Goggleheads, I realized they were a 3D expression of the kind of practitioner I was studying in the files of Amnesty International. To torture, the practitioner must reduce his victim to the status of animal while protecting his own sense of humanity. The goggle men protect themselves in the most basic way. When you look at them, you can only see yourself in their glasses. You cannot possibly guess what effect your pain is having on them and you can't appeal to them for any mercy. And Uf Kia ordered the death of Ben Barker and apparently he also 
uh, says in the one book that I've managed to find about Frink, he wanted Ben Barker's head brought to him, which is particularly poignant seeing as this sculpture is just a head rather than the whole body. One of the things Frink has always been interested in is human rights, and she was an early member of Amnesty International. She lived in the south of France for uh, several years when there were a lot of French Algerian immigrants coming to live in France, and she became very concerned with human rights there. She grew up in East Anglia. She came from a fairly privileged family, and she made she made, did well very early on. She was noticed very early. So if you too can find this film that I've seen, you can see film of her as a young woman when she went to Chelsea Art College. Her father was in the army, and she grew up in East Anglia. She, she, her dates were 1930 to 1993. So she was 15 when Belson was liberated. And she writes about the effect of seeing that, that film of the liberation of the concentration camps on her practice. But also living in East Anglia, she was aware of the bombers coming back from raids. And I remember seeing a television programme some years ago saying that something like half the young men, and they were young men who became fighter pilots, actually died in Britain on the airfield, crashed before they actually managed to leave and deliver their, their bombs. So she saw horrendous things and planes coming back in flames, which had a great effect on her. Um, her oeuvre is human beings and animals, mostly men, hardly any women at all. She was married three times, she was very interested in men, apparently she was very open about her sexuality and uh, lived life to the full, but mostly it is the brutal aspects of men, I'm afraid, that, that come across, their violence, their thuggishness, their brutality, their cold, unfeeling nature. She also did a lot of birds, not the lovely birds that I was listening to when I was sitting in my garden writing these notes this morning, but uh, birds of prey and violent birds. And if you do go to see any of her work, it often is you know, the, the brutish side of animal nature that you see. She started work, she worked very quickly. She knew she wanted to be a sculptor very early on and she, she couldn't wait to work in bronze. So what she did, she made an armature of steel rods and coated it with plaster. And again, in this film, you see her slapping it on, literally working very, very quickly. She did some carving with the wet plaster of Paris and then left it until it dried and then carved into it again. And then as this, and this is a series of six, she had them cast in bronze. So it had to be a very immediate way of working that she was particularly interested in. I've talked about the violence that, that she is referring to all the time, but, and also Amnesty International, and, she, but she, and many of her men have their eyes closed, not just goggles hiding them, but actually with their eyes closed in suffering. But to, towards the end of the 80s, she did a series of tribute heads, which were men, very poignantly, who had died for their beliefs, political prisoners, and they actually have their eyes open. If I could have carried the heavy book that I used, which I'll tell you about in a minute, I would have shown you photographs of that, but they are really poignant. I mean, a lot of her work, I don't think you'd want it in your living room, um, apart from the size of your living room, but these are really poignant and very, very beautiful. Her last piece of work, I think she did have a religious aspect to her life, I don't know if she was conventionally religious, was the huge risen Christ above the doorway of the Anglican Cathedral. And it literally kept her alive. She had throat cancer and I think she had many operations in this film. Again, it was incredibly poignant and I hope all the students I've showed it to can remember it as well. You saw her as a young woman with a cigarette about this long in her mouth, you know, having a great time and then you saw her as a skeleton almost but still working she worked up until about a fortnight before the sculpture was put up she went to the foundry in London where she had the, where the cast made and she was up on ladders she was swathed in goggles and scarves and things and working chiseling away his face which we can't see because it's it's too high but it's a very poignant thing that he is the risen Christ now on my way in this morning I'm going to, I hope you know there are several pieces of Frink's work in Liverpool and I thought I'd just check on them in case you are inspired uh, to go and have a look at them themselves. When I looked at the risen Christ leaving the cathedral this morning, his face is absolutely grim. His eyes are open, 
but he might have risen but what he's looking at he doesn't like at all humanity and man's inhumanity to man but what they also have at the cathedral but you can't see it because it's um, put away at the moment they have the maquette that she worked from and I marched in there this morning and there it wasn't so I asked somebody and it's put away because they're putting a lift in you can also go into the Catholic Cathedral and an early piece of work of hers is a rather sinuous um, brass piece of sculpture above the altarpiece, hanging in the air. In this book there's also an altar, uh, a, cru a crucifixion she did for a church in Belfast which looks very poignant. And then you can go around the back from here, let me borrow my visual aid please, and you can see um, one of her running men. Now, when this first appeared, which is a couple of years ago, I thought it was a symbol of joy, of exuberance, of the kind of running that we might like to do when we can. But reading about it, apparently they also are hunted figures. They are either running away from something or running towards something. So I just went to have a look at him today and thinking about violence and torture and beastly things in our world. I just went to check to see what I thought about him. And somebody has defaced him in the last few days with red pen paint, uh, which is very poignant there. Um, and if you have a car, I have tried to go to this place on public transport, which was a bit of a laugh, but very difficult. Yorkshire Sculpture Park is absolutely magnificent, and it has lots of Frink's work. It's got her Judas, who is just an image of utter brutality. He's hunched, and his eyes, his eyes are shut, and he is just absolutely beastly. But I do encourage you to go there, A, because it is nature as well. And to come back, I kind of finishing and keep talking forever and I'll tell you about the book in a minute. Um, yes, humanity is beastly and the kind of, the, the, the skimming over I've talked about of torture in Algeria, we don't have to look very far today, do we, to look for things like that. Um, you know, we think of the Middle East, but what about Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay? Um, you know, it is, violence is all around us and it is utterly beastly, but that doesn't make you feel any better about life or want to go and look at more art. So Frink did a lot of work in nature. She had a wonderful studio in Dorset with glass wind with huge glass walls instead of windows. And it, it is full, I, I presume you can go, but I don't know, full of dogs and water buffalo and horses and they are absolutely magnificent. When I decided to do this talk I thought I'd better see A what I can remember and B what else what information there is. The internet of course is a movable feast you know if you look at the Algerian War of Independence you think was it really like this because there are so many ridiculous versions of it but I went to the library our wonderful new central library I thought I'll test them out because the building is wonderful. I'm not sure there's as many books as there were, uh, but I'll test them on Elizabeth Frink. And sure enough, they found a book for me and this chap led me towards it. And it's a huge book. It's absolutely beautiful and full of pictures of her, pictures of her sculpture and just stunning. Published in 1984. It was her catalogue of work up till then. And I thought, I'd like one of these. Sorry about that. I'd like one of these. So I googled it and it came up as £881. Now, then I thought, oh my god, this book, what can I do with it? And I've been into the library and said to them, do you realise how valuable this is? Now, I don't know if my copy, which I'm taking back tomorrow or the day after, is because it is battered and somebody's drawn a dog in it and things like that. But presumably there aren't very many. So when I take it back, I, am, I feel very... Um, passionate about free libraries and things you know on display and people to take them home I wonder if they should be allowed to do it whether that should be a reference copy but it should be back in central libraries very shortly um, what have I missed out absolutely loads of things how let me let me finish on a quotation from Frink herself um, which kind of contradicts something else that she said I am an optimist I'm not sure about that but this is what she wrote about the gogglehead particularly my concern is not that mankind is any worse than it was, it is just that it is as bad as it was. The media get news of atrocities to us more quickly than in the dark ages, and we are living in a dark age of humanity. We are becoming brutalised and no longer respond properly to atrocity. And she wrote that in 1983, and as I said before, I suspect that is still very common today. Does anybody have any questions?
Well, do go and have another look at him, and I can now tell you he, this chap, he was made in 1967. Actually, just another slightly interesting thing, once I've got an audience, I'm not stopping. There were some wonderful programs before Christmas on areas of London that had been mapped in Victorian times by Colonel Booth, a social survey of those areas, and it went back, these six programs went back to these different areas now, uh, two years ago. One of the areas was Notting Hill, which has had many fortunes, and I remember it when I was 17 or 18, it was desperately poor and dangerous. I said this to my son and he said, Notting Hill, it's incredibly expensive. And sure enough, we went into a beautiful Georgian house in Notting Hill, like houses we have in Liverpool, but refined to a high standard. And there were two, I think they were both barristers, uh, two young men living there, and they had one of those. Not quite on their mantelpiece, but, uh, you know, in their house. Because there are still, again, if you look on Google, there are still things to buy. I don't know about the, um, the bronzes, but drawings and things like that. Okay, thank you.